This is a tutorial on the rotation of conic sections. When we talk about the rotation of conic sections, we're talking about ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas, or circles that have been rotated off their standard axes. Here we have the example of an ellipse, and it's been rotated off the standard x and y axis, so its axes of symmetry are no longer parallel to the x and y axes. Their axis of symmetry looks more like this. Now because this ellipse is rotated, we cannot just look at the standard equation, which would be x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared is equal to 1. a squared and b squared tell us the location of our vertices. Well because our axes are not in line with the standard x and y axes, this equation no longer fits the description of this ellipse. So finding these vertices and finding the foci for this ellipse becomes a lot more difficult. Now before we can talk about rotating conic sections, let's talk about how we rotate a single point or the coordinates of a single point. Here I have a point and it has an x and y coordinate. This would be its x coordinate and this is its y coordinate. But imagine that when I had done this, I was standing over here, and when I measured, I measured a y coordinate and an x coordinate. And I'm going to call this x prime and y prime to show that these coordinates are off this x prime and y prime axis, or this axis that's been rotated. The angle that this axis has been rotated, I'm going to call this theta. Now if I wanted to find the coordinates of this point, well, then I could find the distance from the origin, which I'm going to call r, and then when I measured my x prime and my y prime, I would need this angle off my x prime axis, which I'm going to call gamma. Now when I measured my x prime distance, I knew that's the same as r times the cosine of gamma. And then my y prime distance, that's equal to r times the sine of gamma. But I didn't really want x prime and y prime. What I really wanted was the x and y coordinates of this point. Well my x coordinate, that's still equal to r but it's times the cosine of both of our angles together. It's this whole angle, which I'm going to call gamma plus theta. And then my y distance here, that's the side opposite, so y is equal to r times the sine of gamma plus theta. Now remember, I measured x prime and y prime. So I want to turn these equations of x and y into versions of x prime and y prime because that's the information that I know. Well, looking at this cosine of alpha plus theta, I can use the sum formula for cosines and I can say that this is the same as r times the cosine of gamma times the cosine of theta minus the sine of gamma times the sine of theta. Then if I distribute this r inside, I'll see that x is equal to r times the cosine of gamma times the cosine of theta minus r times the sine of gamma times the sine of theta. Now look closely here. If we have r times the cosine of gamma, that's equal to x prime. 
And if I have r times the sine of gamma, that's equal to y prime. Remember, that's what I measured. So x is equal to x prime times the cosine of theta, which is the angle that I rotated my axes, minus y prime times the sine of theta. So now all I need is my angle of rotation, and I can use my x prime and my y primes to find my actual x coordinate. Now for our y coordinate, we're going to do something similar. Using the sum of sines, I can say that y is equal to r times, now the sine of gamma plus theta, that's the same as the cosine of gamma times the sine of theta, now plus this time, the sine of gamma times the cosine of theta. Now again, I'm going to distribute this r inside, so we'll have y is equal to r cosine gamma sine theta plus r times the sine of gamma cosine theta. This here is equal to x prime. This here is equal to y prime. So our y coordinate then is just the x coordinate on our rotated axis, x prime, times the sine of our angle of rotation, so theta, sine theta, plus our y coordinate on our rotated axis, so y prime times the cosine of theta. These are the two equations that we're going to use to rotate points or rotate conic sections through different angles, theta, of rotation. So now let's try converting the coordinates of this point from an x prime y prime coordinate to an actual x and y coordinate. And we can use these formulas that we found. Here we're told we have the point 4, 3, but that's measured from this x prime and y prime axis. This distance is x prime, so it's 4, and this distance is y prime, so this is 3. And what we actually want is this distance x and this distance y. And to find that, we'll use these formulas x here is equal to x prime, which is 4, times the cosine of our angle of rotation, which is 30 degrees, so cosine of 30, minus y prime, which is 3, times the sine of our angle of rotation, which is 30. Now the cosine of 30, that's equal to the square root of 3 over 2, so 4 times the square root of 3 over 2, minus 3 times the sine of 30, which is 1 half. So x is equal to all this, and if you plug that into your calculator, you'll find x is approximately 1.96. We do the same thing for y. y is equal to x prime, which is 4, times the sine of our angle of rotation, which is 30 degrees, plus y prime, which is 3, times the cosine of our angle of rotation, which is 30 degrees. So y is equal to 4 times 1 half, because that's what the sine of 30 is equal to, plus 3 times the cosine of 30, which is the square root of 3 over 2. Plug all this into your calculator, and you'll find that y is approximately 4.60. So our coordinates then are 1.96 and 4.60. And that looks about right. This is about 2, and this is about 4.5. Well, now that we know how to rotate points from various rotated axes, let's find out how we know if our conic section is rotated. Here I have an equation of a conic section. You can think of this as the general form of the conic section. And normally, if I wanted to identify this conic section, I would have to complete the square. I would look at just the x terms and I would factor out a greatest common factor of 4. So I would have 4 times x squared minus 6x 
and then I would look at my y terms. I would factor out a greatest common factor of 9. So I'd have 9 times y squared plus 4y. And then I would move my 36 over, so this is equal to negative 36. And then I would complete the square for both the x's and the y's, because they're both squared. To do that, I would have to add 9 to my x's, but I add 9 inside these parentheses. So I'm really adding 9 times 4, so I'm adding 36. So if I add 36 to the left-hand side, I have to add 36 to the right-hand side. And then I look at the y's. I have y squared plus 4y inside the parentheses. I would have to add 4 to make this a perfect square. But if I'm adding 4, I'm really adding 4 times 9, which is 36 again. I'm adding 36 to the left-hand side, so I have to add 36 to the right-hand side. Now that I've completed my square, I can factor these into 4 times x minus 3 squared plus 9 times y plus 2 squared, and that's equal to 36. Divide everything by 36, and I'll get x minus 3 squared over 9 plus y plus 2 squared over 4 is equal to 1. Now looking at this equation, this is the equation of an ellipse. Well, there's an easier way to identify a conic section without completing the square. This easier method for identifying a conic section is using the discriminant. And the discriminant is similar to the discriminant on a quadratic equation. Here I have the general form of a conic section, and it's written as ax squared plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f is equal to zero. Now if I take the number a, which is the coefficient of our x squared term, and I multiply it by the c term, which is the coefficient of my y squared term, if those multiply together is equal to zero, then you're looking at the equation of a parabola. If that's greater than zero, you're looking at the equation of an ellipse. And if it's less than zero, you're looking at the equation of a hyperbola. Now there's also a circle, but if you have a circle, then your a times c will be greater than zero. So if a times c is greater than zero, you have an ellipse or possibly a circle. So let's try this. Here we have the equation 4x squared minus 24x plus 9y squared plus 36y plus 36 is equal to zero. We need to find our a and our c terms. Well my a is whatever my x squared term is being multiplied, so a is equal to 4, and my c is whatever my y squared term is being multiplied, or the coefficient of my y squared term, so that's 9. If I take 4 and multiply it by 9, that's equal to 36, which is greater than 0. So this is an equation of an ellipse, or possibly a circle. Now there's a slightly different equation for when our conic section is rotated. Here is the general form of our rotated conic section. And it's very similar. We still have ax squared, cy squared, dx, ey, plus f. It's still equal to zero. The only addition is this b times x times y term. Whenever you have an x times a y term, this is the hint that this conic section is rotated. Now if you want to find out what type of conic section we have, which is being rotated, now our discriminant looks exactly the same as it did for a quadratic equation. Our xy term is being multiplied by this b, and if we have b squared minus 4ac, if that's equal to zero, you have a parabola. If it's less than zero, you have an ellipse, and if it's greater than zero, you have a hyperbola. So let's look at this equation here. 57x squared plus 14 times the square root of 3 xy plus 43y squared minus 576 is equal to 0. Well, we have an xy term here, which means this conic section 
is being rotated because we're multiplying an x times a y. Now if we want to find out what type of conic section this is, I need my b term, which is this 14 square roots of 3. I need my a term, which is whatever x squared is being multiplied by, so 57. And my c term, which is whatever y squared is being multiplied by, which is 43. Plug all this in into b squared minus 4ac. We'll have 14 times the square root of 3, all squared, minus 4 times 57 times 43. If you plug all of this into your calculator, you'll end up with negative 9,216, which is less than zero. So this equation is the equation of an ellipse. So now that we've figured out how to identify if our conic section is rotated, let's talk about how we know how much it's rotated. Again here I have my general equation for a rotated conic section. If I want to know how much it's rotated, once again I just need my a, my b, and my c terms. The cotangent of 2 times theta, which is the angle of rotation, is always equal to our a term minus our c term over our b term. Here again, we have 57x squared plus 14 times the square root of 3xy plus 43y squared minus 576 is equal to 0. This is the same equation that we found was an ellipse earlier. It has an x and y term, so it is a rotated ellipse. And if I want to find out how much it's rotated, I take my a term, which is 57, and I subtract my c term, which is 43, and I divide it by my b term, which is 14 times the square root of 3. That means the cotangent of 2 times theta is equal to all of this, which is 14 over 14 square roots of 3. Now if the cotangent of 2 theta is equal to this, that means the tangent of 2 theta would be equal to the reciprocal of that, so 14 square roots of 3 over 14. Take the inverse tangent of both sides using your calculator, and you'll find that 2 theta is equal to 60 degrees. And that means that theta is equal to 30 degrees. So this ellipse has been rotated off the standard x, y axes 30 degrees. So here I have the graph of my ellipse. Still have my equation. It's the same ellipse that we've been dealing with. And we know that this has been rotated 30 degrees. That means my major and minor axes look like this, and that this angle here is 30 degrees. Now what I'm going to do next is try to find the equation of our ellipse using the x prime and the y prime axes. I'm basically going to find the equation for this ellipse if it had not been rotated. Now to unrotate this ellipse, this is a long process with many steps, so it's very easy to make a mistake, so you're going to have to be very careful. To unrotate this ellipse, I'm going to use the equations x is equal to x prime times the cosine of theta minus y prime times the sine of theta. And y is equal to x prime times the sine of theta plus y prime times the cosine of theta. These are the same equations that we found before to find the new coordinates of a point. Well now I'm trying to rewrite this equation in terms of x prime and y prime so I can find out the equation of this ellipse with respect to axes 
x prime and y prime. Now normally you would also use the cotangent of 2 theta is equal to a minus c over b, but we already did this and we know that theta is equal to 30 degrees. So what we do is we plug all of this in for x everywhere we have x in this equation. And we plug all of this in everywhere we have a y in this equation. So first we have 57 times x squared. Well x is equal to x prime times the cosine of theta. But theta is equal to 30 degrees so the cosine of 30 degrees minus y prime times the sine of 30 degrees. And then this is all squared because it's x squared. And then plus 14 times the square root of 3 then times x which again is x prime times the cosine of 30 degrees minus y prime times the sine of 30 degrees and then multiply that by y so this is multiplied by x prime times the sine of 30 degrees plus y prime times the cosine of 30 degrees. And then plus 43 times y squared, so x prime sine 30 plus y prime cosine 30, and that's all squared, and then minus 576 is equal to zero. Now to make this a little bit simpler, the cosine of 30 degrees, that's equal to the square root of 3 over 2. And the sine of 30 degrees, that's equal to 1 half. So I'm going to plug all of that in here for cosine 30 and sine 30. So this is going to become 57 times now the cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2, so the square root of 3 over 2 times x prime minus, now the sine of 30 is 1 half, so 1 half y prime, and that's all squared, plus 14 times the square root of 3 times x prime times the cosine of 30, well the cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2, so the square root of 3 over 2 times x prime and then minus y prime sine 30 so 1 half y prime and then times sine 30 x prime so 1 half x prime plus cosine 30 y prime so the square root of 3 over 2 y prime. Then we add 43 times 1 half x prime sine 30 x prime plus the square root of 3 over 2 y prime y prime. That's all squared. Now I'm going to move the 576 over so this is all equal to 576. Next I'm going to square this first set of parentheses. So I'll have 57 times now imagine this as the square root of 3 over 2 x prime minus 1 half y prime multiplied by the square root of 3 over 2 x prime minus 1 half y prime. Now when I do this because I'm going to end up with x prime squares and y prime squares I'm going to drop the primes just remember that we're dealing with the x and y prime axes, not the original x and y axis. Now when I do this multiplication or square this first set of parentheses, I'll have the square root of 3 over 2x times the square root of 3 over 2x, which is equal to 3 fourths x squared. Square root of 3 over 2x times one half y will give us plus the square root of three over four x y. But that's going to be negative because this is a negative one half. 
Then a negative 1 half y times the square root of 3 over 2x gives us another negative square root of 3 over 4xy. And then negative 1 half y times negative 1 half y is a positive 1 fourth y squared. Next I'm going to FOIL out these two sets of parentheses. These are both still multiplied by 14 square roots of 3. Square root of 3 over 2 times x times 1 half x will give us the square root of 3 over 4 x squared. Square root of 3 over 2 x times the square root of 3 over 2 times y will get us a positive 3 fourths xy. Negative 1 half y times 1 half x will give us a negative 1 fourth xy. And negative 1 half y times the square root of 3 over 2y will give us a negative square root of 3 over 4y squared. And then I'm going to FOIL out this 1 half x plus square root of 3 over 2y. Now remember that this is the same as 1 half x prime plus the square root of 3 over 2y prime times 1 half over x prime plus the square root of 3 over 2y prime. So 1 half x times 1 half x will give us 1 fourth x squared. 1 half x times the square root of 3 over 2y will give us a square root of 3 over 4xy. Square root of 3 over 2y times 1 half x gives us another square root of 3 over 4xy. And then the square root of 3 over 2y times the square root of 3 over 2y gives us 3 fourths y squared. Remember this is all still multiplied by 43 and still equal to 576. Now the last thing I want to do is distribute. I'm going to bring this 57 inside. 57 times 3 fourths x squared. That'll give us 42 and 3 fourths, so 0.75 x squared. If I have the negative square root of 3 over 4 xy and another negative square root of 3 over 4 xy, that's the same as the square root of 3 over 2, which is negative, xy. Multiply that by 57 and we'll get a negative 28.5 square roots of 3 xy. And then 57 times one fourth y squared, that's going to be 14 and one quarter y squared. I'm also going to distribute this 14 times the square root of 3. 14 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 over 4x squared, that's going to give us. Well, square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is just 3. 3 fourths times 14 is 10 and 1 half, so 10.5x squared. 14 times the square root of 3 times 3 fourths xy. And then negative 1 fourth xy, if I combine those, I end up with 1 half xy times 14 times the square root of 3. That'll give us a positive 7 square roots of 3xy. And then 14 times the square root of 3 times a negative square root of 3 over 4y squared is a negative 10.5y squared. I'm going to combine these terms and distribute this 43 inside this parentheses. 43 times 1 fourth x squared, that's 10 and 3 quarters, so plus 10.75 x squared. Square root of 3 over 4 xy plus square root of 3 over 4 xy would be the square root of 3 over 2 xy. Multiply by 
43. And we'll get 21.5 square roots of 3xy. And then 43 times 3 fourths y squared. That's 32 and 1 fourth, so plus 32.25y squared. This is all equal to 576. Well, that seemed like a lot, but all I have to do now is combine my like terms. 42.75x squared, 10.5x uh, squared, and 10.75x squared. That all adds together to give us 64x squared. Negative 28.5 square roots of 3xy, 7 square roots of 3xy, and 21.5 square roots of 3xy. Those will all come to be 0 times xy, which is what we were hoping for. Because again, this is the general form, and if this ellipse is not going to be rotated anymore, that means we won't have an xy term anymore. Now for our y squareds, 14.25y squared minus 10.5y squared and then plus 32.25y squared. That all comes together to be a positive 36y squared and this is still equal to 576. Divide everything by 576. And you'll end up with x squared over 9 plus y squared over 16 is equal to 1. So this is the equation of our ellipse. But this is the equation of our ellipse on the x prime y prime axis. So actually this is x prime squared over 9 plus y prime squared over 16 is equal to 1. Now remember, I have found the equation of my ellipse based off of the x prime and the y prime axes. That means that this equation works for only the x prime and y prime axes. So if I wanted to graph this, I can pretend that these x prime and y prime axes are the only ones that exist. So here I have my x prime axis and my y prime axis. I have my equation, x prime squared over 9 plus y prime squared over 16 is equal to 1. This ellipse has the center at the origin. Our a value here is 3, and since that's underneath our x prime, I go from the center out 3, and I'll find a vertice, and out 3 the other direction, I find a vertice. I also go up 4 in the y direction, because this is my b squared term. So 4 and 4. So the graph of my ellipse should look something like that. Remember that this ellipse is actually rotated. But it's easier to deal with this ellipse on these x prime y prime axes than it is on the actual x y axis. So that's how you rotate conic sections. And that completes the tutorial on the rotation of conic sections.